This is Michael Altos recording Autonomic Nervous System number three, Adrenergic Antagonists. In the last lecture, we spoke about the adrenergic system and drugs that are adrenergic agonists and other drugs that are resembling their actions. Today, we're going to talk about adrenergic antagonists, and we'll start with the alpha receptor. Drugs that block the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor are primarily used to cause smooth muscle relaxation. And this will have its most noticeable effect in the vasculature. Smooth muscle relaxation in the arteries and the veins will cause a decrease in blood pressure. Remember that there's a lot of initial vascular tone. There's a lot of alpha tone at rest in the uh, human body. And so alpha blockade can have a very uh, impressive response. People can drop their blood pressure quite a bit. And the side effects, as you would expect, include hypotension, as well as orthostatic hypotension. So a patient may not actually be hypotensive, but when they stand up quickly from a seated or a lying position, they may get that head rush and lightheaded feeling. And the reflex tachycardia that goes along to compensate with hypotension. If patients are hypovolemic, the side effects are more pronounced. Other side effects would be meiosis, nasal stuffiness, and GI upset like diarrhea. As patients use drugs like these chronically, they start to have a blunted sympathetic response. In other words, their ability to mount a sympathetic response in response to a stimulus would be uh, compromised. These people should not have any response at all to phenylephrine because their alpha-1 block, alpha receptors are blocked. As for norepinephrine, we mentioned last week that there is a little bit of beta-1 activity hidden in norepinephrine. We don't normally see it unless we give norepinephrine at very high doses. But once the alpha-1 receptor is totally blocked, then the primary effect of, norep of norepinephrine will be the beta-1 activation, which causes tachycardia. Similarly with epinephrine, the alpha response will be pretty much blocked and so we'll just see the beta response, which is tachycardia, actually some severe hypotension, and that's due to the beta-2 mediated vasodilation. Now we've talked only about the alpha-1 receptor. Don't forget about that unusual alpha-2 receptor. And we said the alpha-2 receptor, alpha receptor has a lot of different roles, but we are focusing primarily on that presynaptic alpha-2 receptor, the one that's participating in the negative feedback loop. So normally, norepinephrine binds to the alpha-2 receptor, and when it stimulates the alpha-2 receptor, that causes the presynaptic terminal to downregulate the release of additional norepinephrine. It's a classic negative feedback loop. If that's the case, then an alpha-2 receptor blockade will eliminate that negative feedback loop and actually will allow for the release of more norepinephrine, which again could lead to what? Well, not hypertension, because the alpha-1 receptor is blocked, so probably, again, just tachycardia, like we discussed right over here. Phentolamine is usually the drug people discuss first when they talk about alpha blockers. It's a non-selective alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptor antagonist. And in general, when we speak about these alpha blockers, many of them bind irreversibly which means that you have to synthesize new alpha receptors before the effect of the blockade is totally re resolved. As we will see, phentolamine itself is more reversible than some of the other alpha uh, blocking drugs, and we'll discuss that in future slides. People have called this a chemical sympathectomy because of its extensive blockade of the alpha receptors. Phentolamine is commonly used in the management of pheochromocytoma, which as we know is an adrenal tumor that secretes epinephrine and norepinephrine causing symptoms like hypertension and tachycardia. I put this here to remind us that we should alpha blockade before beta blockade. That means that when we're treating sympathetic states like a pheochromocytoma or perhaps acute cocaine intoxication, if we give a beta blocker first, we'll see in a few slides that beta blockade decreases the ability of the heart to work. It decreases contractility and cardiac output. And when that is done, while a patient still has a lot of alpha tone, meaning a lot of high blood pressure, which is afterload or peripheral resistance, then you have a weakened heart 
trying to beat against a very high load and you can precipitate acute heart failure. So we always try to do alpha blockade before beta blockade in these cases. Phentolamine also has some cholinomimetic activity, which means it's not a cholinergic drug, but it acts like one, and it causes symptoms like diarrhea or cramping, and these can be treated with an anticholinergic like atropine or perhaps glycopyrrolate. Phentolamine can be given as an IV bolus or as an infusion. As we said before, it reversibly blind, binds to the alpha receptor. And its ability to cause vasodilation has been used in many other situations. For example, it's been used as an intercavernosal injection to increase blood flow to the genitalia as treatment for impotence. It's been used as a subcutaneous injection for the treatment of norepinephrine extravasation. And the idea is that the norepinephrine has extravasated, caused vasoconstriction, and now there's going to be tissue necrosis. So if we inject some phentolamine, it will vasodilate those blood vessels and allow the norepinephrine to be flushed away from the site. Some have even used phentolamine injection to reverse local anesthetics more rapidly, again by increasing blood flow to the site to wash away the drug. Phenoxybenzamine is another alpha blocker, and it's given orally, and typically patients will be given this drug as preoperative management for a pheochromocytoma. This drug actually binds irreversibly. And you may be wondering at this point if a patient has had norepinephrine extravasation or if they've had too much norepinephrine, can we use alpha blockers in treatment? And the answer is yes. The treatment of overdose for phenoxybenzamine is norepinephrine and vice versa because there are always some receptors that remain free of the drug. So even if things bind relatively irreversibly, as is the case with phenoxybenzamine, a high enough dose of norepinephrine will eventually overpower this drug. One last drug, prazosin. Prazosin is an alpha-1 selective antagonist. We don't see as much tachycardia with prazosin than with some of the non-selective alpha antagonists because of that negative feedback loop at the alpha-2 receptor that we discussed before but we still see the orthostatic hypotension and some of the other symptoms. People may be on prazosin for hypertension, for a pheochromocytoma. This drug is also used to reduce prostatic hypertrophy. Similar drugs that you may see patients taking are terazosin, doxazosin, or tamulosin. And we often see these in our urology patients or patients who have urologic comorbidities. Those are the alpha blockers. Take a few moments to consider if you have any questions, and then we will move on. Now we're moving on to the beta receptor, and beta antagonists, or beta blockers, come in a few different generations. The first generation drugs are the non-selective drugs. They bind to the beta-1 and beta-2 receptor equally. The second generation drugs are usually more selective. Specifically, the beta-1 selective drugs have been shown to reduce mortality in patients with heart failure. And this may occur through counteracting this chronic hyperadrenergic state that exists in patients who have heart failure. It may help slow the heart rate, which improves ventricular filling, and thus allows contractility to improve, even though beta blockers decrease contractility directly. And these drugs may also upregulate the beta-1 receptor density in the heart. There are studies that have shown reduced incidence of perioperative myocardial infarction in patients who are uh, stabilized on beta blockers, and this is probably due to reducing myocardial oxygen requirement. And these drugs are very effective in control of tachydysrhythmias, like sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and other such dysrhythmias. First, let's talk about propranolol, also known as indorol. This is the original prototypical nonspecific beta antagonist. This drug could be used to lower blood pressure by many mechanisms. It decreases contractility of the heart. It decreases heart rate. It decreases myocardial oxygen demand by slowing down the work of the heart. 
and it can help slow the ventricular response to any tachydysrhythmia like SVTs or ventricular tachycardia. It can be used to help treat the symptoms of pheochromocytoma. It is one of the mainstay drugs in the treatment of thyrotoxicosis or thyroid storm, and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail next semester. But we don't see this drug used very much anymore, except maybe in the treatment of thyroid storm. The reason is because of the side effects, and these are mostly uh, due to, first of all, the beta-2 side effects cause bronchospasm, which is an unwanted side effect. And in general, with beta blockers, we always worry about heart failure because of this decrease in contractility. And then side effects we expect like bradycardia and AV node heart block, which are expected side effects of any beta-1 blocker. There can be a withdrawal syndrome, which leads to rebound hypertension and tachycardia, and even angina, as the heart suddenly does more work and may exceed the oxygen um, supply versus demand balance. And this is probably due to chronic upregulation of beta receptors while the patient has all of this beta blockade on board. And now when you withdraw the beta blockade, they have all of these receptors that are going to be stimulated. We're going to focus more on the beta-1 selective antagonists. These are really good drugs in patients who have reactive airway disease because there shouldn't be any risk of bronchospasm. Nevertheless, the official guidelines say that you should be careful in patients who have very severe lung disease. Now, I've given an awful lot of beta blockers in my career so far, and I have only ever once seen a patient develop acute respiratory compromise because of a beta blocker. So I would venture to say that even in patients with pretty severe pulmonary disease, these drugs are probably safe. But I guess with any drug, you should consider the risks and benefits and make a calculated clinical decision. These drugs are typically available IV and orally. Metoprolol, also known as low presser, is often given in a bolus of 2 to 5 milligrams at a time IV is metabolized in the liver and has an elimination half-life of three to four hours. Atenolol, sometimes called tenormin, is more renally excreted and has a slightly longer elimination half-life. Esmolol is an interesting beta-1 selective antagonist because it is ultra-short acting. At very high doses, it does have some beta-2 antagonism as well. So you could theoretically see some bronchospasm at higher doses. Esmolol is great for preventing the tachycardia and hypertensive response that we see during intubation, during emergence from anesthesia, during brief procedures like electroconvulsive therapy. And the drug is very, very short acting, which is a benefit in these situations. It's rapidly redistributed in just a couple minutes and then metabolized by ester hydrolysis. Now this is not done by plasma cholinesterase or pseudocholinesterase, so there's no problem using this drug in patients who have a pseudocholinesterase deficiency. A bolus dose is usually somewhere between 0.25 and 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IV, and that's typically the dose that I give as my first dose for patients uh, in the neuro room or uh, in other similar situations. It can also be run as an infusion, usually between 50 and 200 mics per kilogram per minute. Those are the basic beta blockers. Take a moment to see if you have any questions, and then we'll wrap up. Labetalol is a drug that most of you have probably had experience with already. Labetalol is a mixed antagonist. It blocks the alpha and the beta receptors. When we say alpha, it's mostly alpha-1 blockade, which is good. The beta tends to be relatively non-selective. And so what we see is an ability to lower heart rate and blood pressure together. We don't see lowering blood pressure leading to reflex tachycardia. Rather, we see hypotension and bradycardia with this drug. Labetalol is available orally, in which case its alpha to beta ratio is about 1 to 3. When it's given IV, its alpha to beta ratio is about 1 to 7. But don't be fooled. Don't think that this drug is primarily for heart rate. Most people use labetalol for blood pressure. 
Lobetalol will decrease peripheral vascular resistance. It will decrease renin secretion. And there will be, as we said above, some decrease in heart rate. This has really become the common drug of choice for intraoperative and postoperative hypertension. Bronchospasm, you would think, may be an issue because it's beta non-selective. But in fact, bronchospasm has not been commonly reported with this drug. And I don't think I've ever seen it. And I've given an awful lot of labetalol in my practice. The dose of labetalol is anywhere between 2.5 and, and 10 milligrams IV for the initial dose. And it works very quickly. Within a minute or two, you should see the response happening in front of your eyes. People have used labetalol as an infusion, but I would caution against it because it is a long-acting agent with an elimination half-life of five to six hours. There is a related drug called Coreg, Carvedilol, which you'll see patients uh, come in having uh, been prescribed this drug. It's a non-selective beta antagonist and an alpha-1 antagonist. And this medication is used for managing heart failure and left ventricular dysfunction after MI and hypertension. So in a way, it's a lot like labetalol. That's it for adrenergic antagonists. Thanks for your attention, and as always, let me know if you have any questions.